Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Well, as we all know, Roe v. Wade was overturned recently, which of course sparked a lot of discussion and debate in the world of social media. But I've noticed that a lot of misinformation and misconceptions have surfaced in the midst of all that. So even though I typically steer clear of political topics, I'm not going to sit this one out because I think some things need to be addressed. Too many Christians are either uninformed or misinformed about the matter. So first of all, let's review the history of Roe v. Wade. Some people are making the claim that this ruling has politicized the Supreme Court and that up until now it's been free from political influence. But I think that history will show that politics has always influenced the judicial branch of the government, including Supreme Court nominees and decisions. Back in 1972, pro-abortion advocates in several states were looking for a case that could challenge the constitutionality of state laws against abortion on a federal level. Roe v. Wade just got to the Supreme Court first. The Roe in Roe v. Wade was Norma McCorvey, also known as Jane Roe, in the court filings in Texas. She was pregnant with her third child and was seeking an abortion. Her attorneys enthusiastically took her case and argued it in the federal court in Texas and won. When the ruling was appealed, it went before the Supreme Court, where they eventually prevailed. But by that time, McCorvey had already had her third baby. The fact is, she had very little to do with the case. She basically just signed a few papers and showed up at a couple of hearings, and the rest was done by her attorneys. The case was driven by politics more than anything else. During the civil rights era of the 1960s, Thurgood Marshall became the first black justice to sit on the Supreme Court. Marshall was a civil rights litigator for the NAACP for many years prior to his appointment as a federal judge by President Kennedy back in 1961. His appointments to the appellate court and the Supreme Court both came over the objections of Southern Democrat senators who opposed the idea of an activist being appointed to the court. But in the end, despite his controversial history as a liberal judge, his qualifications were undeniable, and he was confirmed. Marshall was one of seven justices who ruled that the right to an abortion was provided under the right to privacy found within the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment, which says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In his comments about the recent ruling, President Biden said that the court took away a constitutional right from the American people. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States expressly took away a constitutional right from the American people. Actually, the court just handed the decision back to the American people through their elected state representatives. Every state in the country has the right to legalize abortion to whatever extent they deem appropriate or to make it illegal. Prior to 1973, they had that right, but it was taken away with Roe v. Wade. The country was founded as a federalist system, which means that the governing powers are divided between the central government and the regional governments, or states. Throughout our history, the states have battled the federal government on issues of sovereignty and jurisdiction. In order for the federal government to claim jurisdiction, it has to have a constitutional basis for doing so. In the civil rights era, the federal government stepped in to protect the rights of black people that were provided for them in the Constitution. In the case of abortion, the federal government could only make it legal throughout the country if it had a constitutional basis for doing so. Other issues like gambling and prostitution aren't addressed in the Constitution, so they're left up to the states. If you live in Dallas, Texas, and you want to go to a casino, you have to drive north about an hour until you cross over into Oklahoma because gambling is illegal in Texas. If you live in Utah and you want to use the services of a prostitute, you have to cross over into Nevada where it's legal. Now, why aren't gambling and prostitution legal in all 50 states? Because there's no constitutional right to gamble or conduct prostitution. So those matters are left up to the states. 
There's never been a concerted effort to make them legal throughout the country like there was with abortion. You see, in the late 60s and early 70s, feminist organizations were pushing to make abortion legal. In Biden's comments, he said that Roe v. Wade was written by a justice appointed by Nixon. Roe v. Wade was a 7-2 decision written by a justice appointed by a Republican president, Richard Nixon. Well, that's true, but he's not giving the whole story on that. Two of Nixon's nominees for the court were rejected by the Democrat majority in the Senate for political reasons. The justice he's referring to was Harry Blackman, who was an extremely liberal judge. Many people assume that because Nixon was a Republican that he was a conservative, but that's just not true. He was a staunch anti-communist, that's true, and a big believer in law and order, but when it came to domestic and economic policy, he was a liberal. He proposed the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, hardly a conservative organization. He implemented a wage and price freeze in 1971, which is something that a true conservative would never do because they believe in free markets. And his health care proposals are considered more radical than Obamacare by many. So it should come as no surprise that Nixon's Supreme Court nominees weren't exactly right-wingers. The truth is, abortion just wasn't a hot topic for the news back in 1973. People were preoccupied with a weak economy, civil rights issues, the Vietnam War, and the Watergate scandal. In fact, the day that Roe v. Wade was decided, Nixon's predecessor, LBJ, died. And that was the major story. But make no mistake about it, the decision was driven by politics and implemented by liberal justices. Having said all of that, Justice Blackman said that the ruling in Roe v. Wade was for medical purposes. He said that the court was not giving women an absolute right to abortion, nor was it saying that the Constitution compels abortion on demand, and that it must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. Unfortunately, the ruling was viewed exactly as he had feared it would be viewed, as an absolute right. The Supreme Court was further politicized in 1987 when Reagan nominated Robert Bork. Bork was a brilliant man with impeccable credentials, but his nomination was railroaded when Ted Kennedy ran a smear campaign against him. Bork's name became a verb, to bork, meaning to dig up dirt on a Supreme Court nominee in an effort to keep them off the court. That's what happened to Clarence Thomas and Brent Kavanaugh. So let's dismiss the notion that up until now, the Supreme Court was off limits when it comes to politics. Another claim is that overturning prior rulings like Roe weakens our judicial system. The fact is, prior rulings are constantly being overturned. That's built into the system. One court rules, and then a subsequent court determines whether that ruling was sound or not. If not, it can be reversed. In the Dred Scott v. Sanford case in 1857, the court ruled 6-3 to three that black people were inferior to white people and couldn't be U.S. citizens. It was overturned as a result of the 13th and 14th Amendments following the Civil War. In 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson allowed for segregation via the separate but equal ruling. It was overturned in 1954 by Brown v. the Board of Education that said, separate but equal was unconstitutional. In 1972, the Supreme Court banned capital punishment on the grounds that the Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishment. So for years, there were no executions anywhere in the United States. Then in 1976, the court lifted the ban, and a year later, Gary Gilmore became the first person to be executed in five years. So it's nonsense to say that overturning a prior ruling is somehow harmful to the system. It's how the system was designed to work in the first place. Now, after Roe was overturned, we heard several pundits claiming that Clarence Thomas said we should also do away with same-sex marriage and contraception. That's not true. Here's what he said. In future cases, we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obersfeld. Any substantive due process decision is demonstrably erroneous. 
we have a duty to correct the error established in those precedents. Substantive due process is a lawyerly way of saying that the courts should be able to protect unenumerated rights, rights that aren't specifically covered in the Constitution, but are implied. Remember what the due process clause said? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Notice that there's nothing in there about the right to privacy or the right to an abortion. Proponents of Roe say that those are unenumerated rights, but now we're into a very subjective area. One man's implied rights is another man's presumed rights. Let me give you an example here. If your boss tells you to be at work at 7.30, you would have to leave home in time to arrive by 7.30, so leaving home earlier than 7.30 would be implied. And that would be a logical implication that everybody would recognize. But how you arrive would be assumed. It might be assumed that you would drive and that you would take a certain route. But maybe your wife would drive you and take a different route. Maybe you'd take the bus. There's a number of reasonable alternatives to you driving yourself on the assumed route. Those alternatives would not be logical implications. They would be assumptions that could very well be wrong. When it comes to unenumerated rights, some are pretty obvious that all would agree to the right to travel, the right to vote, unless you forfeit that right through a felony conviction, and the right to privacy. But the right to an abortion is not a logical implication of the right to privacy. The country is very divided over this because many people consider abortion to be murder. I mean, think about it. Does the right to privacy trump the right to life? If law enforcement has reason to believe that you've committed a murder in the privacy of your home, can they obtain a warrant and search your home for evidence? Absolutely. It's called probable cause. Where's your wife, Mr. Smith? Well, she went to visit her mother a month ago, never came back. Well, what's this blood that we found? Oh, I cut myself shaving. Well, that's a lot of blood. Yeah, it was a deep cut. Okay, well, we're going to have to take a sample of it and check the DNA to make sure it's your blood. Stuff like this happens all the time. Your right to privacy has to take a back seat when somebody's life is in danger. So unenumerated rights have to be rights that are logically implied, not just presumed through political partisanship. Now, getting back to what Clarence Thomas said, he mentioned prior rulings on Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell, which were cases that determined unenumerated rights like birth control and gay marriage. What Thomas was addressing is the use of substantive due process in those rulings. What I think he was saying was that if the unenumerated rights recognized in those rulings aren't logically implied, then they shouldn't be considered protected by the Constitution, and they should be left up to the states to rule on as they deem appropriate, just as they do with gambling and prostitution. Another factor to consider here is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the liberal justice whose death in 2020 allowed Trump to nominate one more judge before the election. Ginsburg had been battling health problems for years and could have retired when Obama was still president. But like most liberals, she was convinced that Hillary Clinton would win the 2016 election and so she could carry on a couple more years. Only Hillary didn't win. So Ginsburg was forced to try to hold on until Trump was out of office, but she didn't make it. Now we're seeing Justice Stephen Breyer, who was nominated by Bill Clinton, retire so that he can be replaced by a Democrat president. This is just more evidence of the political nature of the Supreme Court justices and their nominations and rulings. Speaking of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Many people are unaware of the fact that she was critical of the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling. Here's what a New York Times article said two years ago. 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't really fond of Roe v. Wade, the landmark Supreme Court decision that in 1973 established a constitutional right to abortion. She didn't like how it was structured. The ruling, she noted in a lecture at New York University in 1992, tried to do too much too fast. It essentially made every abortion restriction in the country at that time illegal in one fell swoop, leaving it open to fierce attacks. Doctrinal limbs too swiftly shaped, she said, may prove unstable. It was because of her early criticism of one of the most consequential rulings for American women that some feminist activists were initially suspicious of her when President Bill Clinton nominated her for the Supreme Court in 1993, worried that she wouldn't protect the decision. Of course, they eventually realized that Justice Ginsburg's skepticism of Roe v. Wade wasn't driven by a disapproval of abortion access at all, but by her wholehearted commitment to it. The way Justice Ginsburg saw it, Roe v. Wade was focused on the wrong argument, that restricting access to abortion violated a woman's privacy. What she hoped for instead was a protection of the right to abortion on the basis that restricting it impeded gender equality, said Mary Hartnett, a law professor at Georgetown University, who will be a co-writer on the only authorized biography of Justice Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg believed it would have been better to approach it under the Equal Protection Clause because that would have made Roe v. Wade less vulnerable to attacks in the years after it was decided, Professor Hartnett said. So even the notorious RBG saw how weak the privacy argument was. And Joe Biden wasn't crazy about Roe either back in the day. In 1974, he said, I don't like the Supreme Court decision on abortion. I think it went too far. I don't think that a woman has the sole right to say what should happen to her body. And as recently as 2006, Biden said that he didn't view abortion as a right. Tell me about abortion. Where do, where do you stand and how will you face that issue as a candidate? Um, uh, it's going to be very difficult. I, I do not view abortion as a, uh, um, as a choice and a right. I think it's always a tragedy. But of course, he had to change his position on that once he was chosen to be Obama's vice president. Again, politics. Now, some on the left are saying that this isn't over, but it kind of is. I mean, there's no court beyond the Supreme Court which is why it's called the Supreme Court. Could a subsequent court make a ruling that in effect reinstates Roe? Sure. But in all likelihood, it will be another 10 years before the balance of power on the court shifts enough for that to happen. No doubt the left will try some things to get around this ruling. But if the November elections go the way I think they will, it's going to be hard for anything of a legislative nature to change things. Now, let me just say that I had my reservations about Donald Trump. He used to be pro-choice on abortion, but he changed his position when he decided to run for president. I didn't trust him, and I didn't vote for him in 2016. But whatever else you might think about Trump, on this issue, he came through. I voted for Reagan twice, but two of his justices were duds on Roe v. Wade. I voted for George Bush Sr. twice. But one of his two justices, David Souter, was another dud. I voted for W twice, and one of his justices is John Roberts, who kind of sided with the majority on this ruling, but didn't come through on prior abortion rulings, and overall has been a huge disappointment. But all three of Trump's justices came through in overturning Roe v. Wade, and for that, I commend him. I understand that there are lots of other issues that these justices have to rule on. But when you run for president on a pro-life platform, people expect you to nominate pro-life judges who will rule that way on these cases. All of the Democrat-appointed justices always voted to uphold Roe, but the Republican appointees have been all over the map. Up until now, anyway. So when I said that it wasn't likely that Roe v. Wade would be overturned, I was wrong. The Supreme Court doesn't just say, we overturn Roe v. Wade. First, a case must be presented to the Supreme Court where Roe v. Wade is a precedent for the ruling. If that happens, then the court has to agree to reject the precedent 
thereby overturning Roe v. Wade and establishing a new precedent. After 47 years of Roe v. Wade, that's not very likely. Hey, if I'm going to point out the mistakes of others, I need to point out my own too, right? I've seen so many people fold under the pressure once they get to Washington that I just didn't figure that these judges would be any different. But I was wrong, and I couldn't be happier. One more point I'd like to address here. As Christians, we all know that abortion is wrong, and tens of millions of babies have been slaughtered over the past 49 years because of Roe v. Wade. And that's a tragedy. But you know what's worse than abortion? Jesus culture. Jesus culture. Okay. It's a worship band out of Redding, California. Bill Johnson, part of the New Apostolic Reformation movement. They are huge. 15-minute worship songs, monotonous droning. It's a bigger, far more important issue than even abortion because abortion, yeah, it slaughters infants and we all deplore that and all of that. But these are false prophets who are ushering people into hell. So according to John MacArthur's sidekick, Phil Johnson, a worship team from Bethel Church is worse than abortion. So I guess we should all be petitioning our government to ban Jesus culture now. Just had to throw that in. Thanks for watching, everybody, and be blessed.